Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you all to our service for this second Sunday of the Advent season as we rejoice in all the ways that Jesus comes to us and look forward to his coming in glory. For those of you who are joining us online, you can get a copy of the bulletin by going to our webpage, www.mountcalvarypeoria.org, and then look under news and announcements and you'll find the link for that. With that said, as always, we invite you to fill out one of the registration cards and drop those off in the offering plate when you leave today. If you choose to do an offering at that point, you may do so then as well. With that said, everyone wave at one another. This is our passing of the peace. There you go. All right, very good. We begin with our opening hymn, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. I invite you to stand and turn to page two in the bulletin for the order of confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. I invite you to examine your conscience now in silence before the Lord according to his word and your station in life. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, 
and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. And upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce God's grace to you all. And by the command, and in the stead of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. You brought a vine out of Egypt, it took deep root and filled the land. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Lord, have mercy upon to join the angels in singing the Gloria on Christmas Eve, we sing, Let the Earth Now Praise the Lord for our hymn of praise.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated. The Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and you shall have gladness of heart. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from far. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Our God shall come. As we wait to celebrate Christmas, Joseph and Mary came to them, but they did not greet them or take them in. Mary's time came and the child was born, but the people took no notice. The town in silent stillness lay, even though the heavens rang with the jubilant voices of the angels. So we light this candle as a sign. Let us pray. Gracious Savior, in this time of waiting, open our hearts and eyes to your presence among us. Let us cherish your word and sacraments that we may be warmed by your life and share in your joy. And make our hearts ready with faith to celebrate your birth and greet your return. We ask this in your blessed name. First reading this day is from the prophet Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will lead his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Here ends the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in singing responsibly Psalm 85.
Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to follow me. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace his each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from the second letter of Peter, the third chapter. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since we are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Here ends the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark as recorded in the first chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. 
And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to thee, O Christ. And so we confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who dwells the Son together, is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you may be seated for the hymn. And so I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. 
So between this gospel reading and the passage that we heard from Isaiah chapter 40, we have an embarrassment of riches set before us to hear and reflect on this morning. But let me set the context before we start tearing into things. Last week, you may remember, we heard of Jesus coming to his city, Jerusalem, humble and gentle, riding on a donkey. Now we know that he was come to redeem and restore but that doing that work would also come at the cost of his own life. The innocent victim whose sacrifice of himself would atone for all sin. And we know that he also comes to us with redemption in answer to that plea that we also heard from Isaiah last week. Oh, that you, God, would rend the heavens open and come down. And we recognize that Jesus is God come down to deliver us. Now that was last week. This week, a question is put before us. Since the king has come to you, how do you prepare to greet him? How do you get ready to receive him? And of course, we know before we even get started trying to answer, there's no such thing as getting ready enough to greet Jesus. And certainly we recognize that it's not our preparations that make it possible for him to come to us, nor do our preparations influence his decision to come. He comes whether we are ready or not. He comes, irrespective of whether we've prepared well or badly or not at all. So we might ask, well, then what's at stake in preparing to receive him? Well, I think it's something like this, whether or not we can actually get the most out of his coming to us or not. And here's a weak example. Back in the pre-COVID days, you may remember when you used to have company over to your house. Maybe it was friends, family, co-workers during the holiday season. And wasn't it the case then that you were more relaxed, that you could enjoy yourself more when everything was prepared, when everything was under control? Well, I'd suggest it's that way with Jesus as well. When we have prepared for him, I think we are more attuned to his love and his grace, that we receive more fully of his joy and life, and then we are in turn better able to share his life and his love and his grace with those around us. So how do we prepare? Well, how did God prepare Israel to receive Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry? Behold, I send my messenger who prepares the way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make his path straight. Now it's fascinating to see that Mark is inspired to start the gospel, the good news of Jesus and his victory, with John the Baptist appearing in the wilderness is the fulfillment of God's promise to send a herald ahead of the Messiah to prepare the people for the Lord. And the way that God used John to prepare the people to greet Jesus can be a good template for our preparations as we greet Jesus coming to us now. And so we begin with John fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy that when the glory of the Lord would be revealed for all flesh to see, that when the Lord's Messiah would come with deliverance and pardon to comfort his people, that first a voice would cry out, prepare. Prepare a highway for our God to travel on. Make sure that the valleys are filled up and the mountains are leveled, that the crooked is made straight and the rough places smooth. But then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what does that mean exactly? I mean, after all, God doesn't need us to engage in mighty works of civil engineering in order to be able to come to us. Now, if you will, what Isaiah is getting at is that the messenger's call to prepare means to remove all obstacles that would impede the Lord's coming to us. He is coming with salvation, and we want him to arrive quickly and to come to us as easily as possible. Now, here's another weak example. You know, if the fire department's coming over to your house to douse the flames, you don't want them slowed down by anything, do you? You don't want to put barricades out in the street. You don't want to dig ditches in front of your house. You're not going to lock the doors. But of course, it's, it's not deep valleys or crooked roads that keep God from coming to us. It's our sin, right? The sins that we cling to, the, the habits that we give into, These are what stand between us and God coming to us with glory and deliverance. And so to prepare for his coming, what do we need to do? We need to straighten out the crooked paths in our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you you or I are capable of moral transformation that would somehow make us sinless. We remain Adam's descendants until the day we lay our bodies down in the grave. 
But there are obvious sins that we can struggle against. Because as long as we accept them, as long as we tolerate them, we're essentially spurning the grace that Jesus brings to us. So let's say, for instance, you love to say mean things about the other side in our current cultural and political divisions. Well, stop it. I mean, yeah, you can disagree. Yes, you can try to convince and persuade, but don't attack and tear down. Or, or let's say you, you struggle with being sexually pure and decent in all that you say and do. Well, look at the things that are encouraging you to sin and put that stuff out of your life. Now, this doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle with desires and thoughts, but if you can turn away from words and deeds, then progress is being made. And we can go on down the list of popular sins, right? I mean, you know, anger, pride, envy, greed, sloth, gluttony. We have some control over all of these. And we make ready the way for the Lord to come to us by getting these sins under some sort of control. So John began with crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And then what came next? John baptized people for repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Now, I got to speak about this gospel reading over at Concordia on Thursday, and I explained to the young folk that John's baptism is not what we do with holy baptism today, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, repentance and forgiveness. In a sense, we've already kind of spoken about repentance when we pointed out that as Jesus comes to us, we need to start reigning in our obvious sins, at least as much as we can according to our old nature. But repentance is a little more than just that. The Greek points to having literally another mind about yourself and about your life. And here's what I mean. All of us are basically hardwired to think that we're okay people. And if we think that we're basically okay, that means that we think that what we say and what we do and what we think and what we feel, that's all okay too. And if we think that, then we don't really have any reason to change, do we? As the old saying goes, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Now, what happens with repentance is that with God's word and spirit working on our hearts, we come to see that, in fact, we are not okay. We come to see that we are spiritually and morally a mess. And, and we feel badly about what we say and what we do and what we think and what we feel. And when we feel bad about those things... Good heavens, we end up feeling bad about ourselves, too. And we don't like that. That's why repentance is hard. It goes against all of our instincts. And it doesn't stop there. It begins with sorrow and shame over our sin, but then it leads us to turn around. It leads us to want and pursue a new life, a good life. And to do that, we need two things, right? We need first to be freed from sin and its guilt and its condemnation. And that's what forgiveness is about. John called the people to repent, and then he forgave them so that they would be free of sin. Forgiveness literally means to set loose, to, to free, to release something. When God forgives us, he frees us from the guilt and shame of our sin. It's, it's just gone. It's buried now in Christ. God frees us from condemnation. There is no judgment for those whose sins are forgiven. And God frees us from the, the habitus of sin, right? That is, that we're no longer stuck having to do the same sins over and over and over and over again, right? A new possibility is set before us. We can do what is good and proper instead. So the people John baptized confessed their sins. They repented. They were forgiven so that when Jesus came to them, they would be able to hear him and receive him and follow him without fear. But of course, there was one more thing needed. You see, even when we repent, even when we clear away some of the detritus of our sin, even when we're freed to do what is right, even with all of that, the condition that we've inherited from Adam leaves us a little cold toward God. We don't naturally like the idea of God being over us. We want to be in charge of our own lives. We want independence so long as we can get what we want along with that independence. So finally, in order to receive our king and to live with the Lord who comes to us, righteous and having salvation, we need to be prepared by having a new life. A life that has a different root and, and, and source than Adam. 
a life that comes from a perfect and righteous servant and obedient son. And John the baptizer knew that he couldn't give that to the people. He couldn't give the people that kind of life. And so he told them, there is a mighty one who is coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus baptizes, he doesn't simply free us from sin or give us forgiveness. He gives us life. He gives us new life. He gives us his Holy Spirit to live in us so that we die to Adam's life and grow into Christ's life. We become temples of the Holy Spirit. We become carriers of Christ. For you remember what St. Paul was moved to write to the Galatians. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Only when we are baptized into Christ and receive his life are we finally prepared for fellowship with God, the fellowship that Christ brings us. Only then are we ready to be restored to the family and to life so that we can take our place at the table and live in his grace. And then, having received him and being brought into the household, we can go forth to bear the fruits of his life and spirit, living in holiness and godliness as we wait his coming in glory. Even so, amen. And now may that peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds until the glorious day of Christ's appearing. Amen. I invite you to stand and turn to page 11 as we join to sing the offertory. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy Now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, the Father of all light and wisdom, you are righteous in all your ways and true in all your judgments. We give thanks to you for your word, for your statutes and testimonies, for your laws and commandments, for your sacred ordinances and your sure word of prophecy, and most especially, for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For your whole counsel, we praise you. We confess with thanksgiving that your truth is pure, giving light to the eyes, that it is perfect, converting the soul, that it is sure, making the simple wise, that it is right, giving joy to the heart, that it is true, guiding the lost, that it is good, giving strength to the weak, that it is light, leading us to Christ. We ask your blessing on those who preach, teach, read, and study your word, that all men and women may hear the joyful sound of the gospel. O Lord, in your mercy. O God, fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us that we may serve and love you with pure hearts, worship you with clean hands, obey you with willing minds, trust you with perfect confidence, fear you and none other, and love you above all the world. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to the end, that we, trusting in your word and promise which have been confirmed to us by the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, may here and in the world to come glorify and praise you forevermore. O Lord, in your mercy. To this end, guard and preserve us that the devil, the world, and our own flesh may not deceive us, nor lead us into any error, unbelief, and sin. Teach us to watch and pray always, that abiding faithful even unto death, we may be counted able to escape those things that shall come to pass upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man, Jesus our Lord, who shall come to be our judge. Keep us steadfast in faith and love that we may in no way fail to obtain that inheritance which he has promised to all who have faith in him and through repentance come to love and serve him. O Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for your church, O God, that all schisms 
scandals and heresies may be put out of the way, and that she may serve you in truth, purity, and single-minded devotion. O Lord, in your mercy, Give peace and stability to the nations of the earth. Put down all evil rulers and raise up those who will serve after your good pleasure. Lord, in your mercy. We pray your blessing upon our homes and families. May Jesus Christ rule the hearts of parents and children. Give strength and healing after your good counsel to the sick. Give comfort to those who sorrow. Give guidance to our youth. Give joy and hope to the aged. Give courage to the perplexed. Lord, in your mercy. Hear and here's the stage we bring our concerns to you in our hearts. We lift up before you the family and friends of Todd Hetty as they mourn his death and pray that you would give them peace in Christ's triumph over the grave and the promise of the resurrection. Grant grace and health to Penelope Lampton, Lee Moshbaugh. Continue to heal and strengthen Carol Hoffman, the Reverend Ralph Laufer, Linda Crook, Jim Casper, Ardeen Ruckel, Carol Lockridge, Joy Wessler, Penny Voss, Ms. Ritter, Gary Ruckel, Natalie Felice, and Cheryl. Give relief to Mark Manthe, give healing to Harriet Coy, Brian Kelly, Michael Wilson, Virginia, David, Shirley, and Deaconess Jillian. Grant recovery to Graylin and Mark, continue to strengthen Alice. Grant health and strength to Sheriff Hoff and Sally Taylor, Ann Bulwark, Marjorie Ruskusky, Earl Boyette, Kathy, Valerie, Chris, Patty, Jim, and Gary. Continue to heal Dave, Lori, Joan, Dale, and Richard. Give continued strength to Jan and Sally, also be with Cheryl Rebel, Gloria, Jameson, Richard, Sally, Steve, and Adriana. Watch over Michelle Taggy and the child she bears, Susie Fink, Esther, Joan, Jenny Bradley, Pat Getz, Theo Norman, Rebecca, Lois, Tamisha, Jenny, John, Laurel, Constance, Linda, Carl, Kenneth, and Lori. Grant them all wellness. Speed healing for Pam and Dolores. Bless the Tompkins family and Clara. Grant grace to Jackie and her family. Give relief to Kathy and Lil. Grant strength and healing to Josh, Bill, Bray Lynn, and Gabby. Give health to Gordon, Jim, Lloyd, and Elwin. Be with all travelers to give them safe journeys. Also watch over Shirley, Max, Miracle, Neil, Shane, Faith, Jenna, Steve, Diane and Wally, Steve and Jerry, Eric, Gloria, Sandra, and Phyllis. Give grace and healing to Christiane, Ruth, Phyllis, and Roy. Be with Luann and Shelby Cooper, Yasmin and Gail, uphold Rick. Give healing to Gary. Strengthen Sharon and Kathy. Give health to Joel. Be with Debbie Block, Deb Alley, Marsha, Delcy Lane, Michelle Teal, Becky Richards, Dave, Rob Powell, Mark Dickman, Olivia Bradley, Sharon Rumbold, Sherry Emberton, Ron Miller, Sandra, Larry, Rod, Pastor Center, Jenny, David, Shannon, Rudy, Ward, Michael, Dale, Kathy, and Jonathan, and give them all your healing and strength according to your will. Support those who are recovering from disasters of various sorts. Be with all those who are working to bring relief in every place where they are needed. We pray that you bring peace and justice to the nations and keep the scourge of war far off. We pray for those suffering from the coronavirus and ask you to impede its spread and grant healing and relief. We continue to pray your grace and strength to all medical workers and first responders. Heal the divisions that bring bitterness to our nation. We especially implore your grace to end all ethnic and racial bigotry and grant understanding, grace, and equity to all. We lift up all who have suffered violent attacks this last week, praying that you grant mercy, healing, faith, and justice, O Lord. Bring us peace. Watch over Pastor Hake and his family continue to give strength and recovery to Ivy and bless their service in Kyrgyzstan. Bless the ministry of Concordia Lutheran School. Be with all students and educators everywhere to keep them in health. Give grace and support to all learning situations. Be with our Senate and all of its officers, Matthew, our Synodical President, Mark, our District President, and all Senate and District officials, that they may be guided by your word to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Grant stability, faith, and hope to all who are struggling in this economy. Bless the people of Haiti as they struggle to recover and establish a stable civil life. Grant shelter and protection to all refugees, especially those displaced by the conflict in Syria. Finally, we ask you to send your spirit of peace to Somalia, Myanmar, the Ukraine, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Nagorno-Karabakh, the Middle East, especially Gaza, Iraq, Egypt, Syria, and Yemen, 
and all places torn by war or civil strife. O Lord, in your mercy. We also ask that while our nation continues to live with peril, and while many remain in harm's way, that you would watch over us and show your mercy to all who are in danger or who suffer in any way. Comfort those who mourn, heal those who are injured, give wisdom and humility to those in authority. Continue to be with Derek Foote, Joshua Zook, Alex Zook, and all deployed and active duty military personnel and their families. Protect all innocent civilians and bring the wicked to justice. Defend the righteous and lead all to repent of evil and seek your peace. We know that all things are in your hands, Father, and we ask that you would bring justice and establish fair government according to your good and perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead all of us to look now and always to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who in his second advent will receive us and all who believe in him to himself and to you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit. For you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated as I prepare the table. I invite you to stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we loud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy. but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, drink, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Maybe seated as we sing the Lamb of God. I invite you to stand. May the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most precious blood strengthen you in true faith, and granting you the forgiveness of sins unto life everlasting. Amen. We join in singing the Nunc Dimittis. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 We join in the closing hymn.
Three quick announcements. Announcement number one. Those of you who use contribution envelopes, they're ready for 2021. And if you want to pick them up, they're over in the fellowship hall on the table just on the other side of those doors. Number two, uh, it is time to transition out of fall decoration into anticipating Christmas decoration. We'll be doing that after the 1145 service. So if you wanted to come back around 1230 or so, we will keep you socially distanced, but uh, we'd at least like to get uh, some of the greenery up in the sanctuary. And then last but not least, Next Sunday is our semi-annual voters meeting at 1030. You can do it in person or you can do it by Zoom. We'll be sending that invitation out this week. We need 25 voting members for a quorum, so we encourage you to be a part of that. And with that said, the service has ended. Go in peace.